Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today, we're uh, really venturing into something pretty fascinating, maybe even revolutionary. We're talking about physicist Hal Puthoff's patent for quantum communication. Yeah, and the, you know, the kind of edge science that swirls around it. It's all about finding a way to communicate that might just, well, leapfrog the usual limitations we face. I'm trying to talk to a submarine way down deep. Exactly. Or, you know, reaching a spacecraft during re-entry when it's surrounded by that plasma sheath, places where normal radio waves, even light, just hit a wall. Right. And this is perfect for you, our listener, if you like getting your head around these big kind of wild ideas, but uh, without drowning in technical details. It sounds like sci-fi almost. But it's rooted in some very real, though maybe kind of mind-bending, quantum physics. And Hal Putoff isn't just some theorist. He's actually done experiments, holds patents. He's been working on the fringes for a long time. You might have even heard him talking about this stuff on Joe Rogan's show recently. That really got people buzzing. It did. He talked about this exact concept, communicating without standard electromagnetic waves. Which also brings in Ashton Forbes. Uh. He's an independent researcher who's been digging into what Putoff said. Yeah, Forbes has some, let's say, interesting interpretations. He connects Putoff's work to some much broader, sometimes uh, pretty speculative concepts. So our mission today is basically to unpack the core science here. What's behind Putoff's patent? What are Forbes' interpretations really about? We want to get the science straight, you know, separate it from the more, let's call them, out there claims. Yeah, try to ground it a bit, expect some surprises, maybe a few aha moments along the way. Okay, so let's start with the basics. Why can't we just use regular radio for that submarine? Right. Seems like it should work, but it's like Putoff said, you know, yelling at a metal wall doesn't really achieve much. The sound just bounces off or gets absorbed. It's similar with electromagnetic waves. Conductive materials, that's metal, seawater, plasma, like around a re-entering ship, they react strongly to the electric and magnetic fields in those waves. So the material itself fights back. Kind of, yeah. The incoming wave makes charges move in the material, and those moving charges create their own opposing fields. These new fields essentially cancel out the original signal. Like an anti-signal signal. signal. Precisely. The barrier effectively puts up its own shield. That's why getting signals through seawater is so hard, they have to use super low frequencies, which means super low data rates. And the plasma blackout during re-entries, same idea. Exactly. That plasma is highly conductive, a great EM shield. So Puthoff's whole angle is, what if we could send a signal that doesn't primarily rely on those E and B fields? Okay, so if the fields are the problem, what's the alternative? This is where it gets quantum, right? Potentials versus fields. You got it. Classically, we think of the electric field E and magnetic field B as the real deal, the things carrying force and energy. The math also uses something called scalar potential think voltage and vector potential, which is linked to the magnetic field. But those potentials, classically, they were just seen as mathematical tricks, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Convenient tools for calculation, but the fields were the actual physical things. That was the standard picture, yeah. Until quantum mechanics threw a spatter in the works with something called the Aharonov-Bohm effect back in 59. Ah, okay. What did that show? It showed that these potentials, A and phi, can actually have real measurable physical effects even in places where the electric and magnetic fields themselves are completely zero. Hang on. No fields, but the potentials still do something. How does that work? Okay, picture this. A long coil of wire, a solenoid, with a magnetic field trapped tightly inside it. Outside the coil, the magnetic field B is basically zero. Right. But the vector potential A associated with that trapped field isn't zero outside the coil. Now, if you shoot electrons around the solenoid, carefully keeping them out of the B field, okay. their quantum behavior, like how their wave functions interfere, gets shifted. It's as if they somehow felt the magnetic field inside, even though they never went near it. So they're reacting directly to this vector potential thing, even without a magnetic force acting on them. Exactly. It's been confirmed experimentally many times. It proves potentials are physically significant at the quantum level. They carry information. They can affect particles, even where E and B fields are absent. That's quite a twist. So Putoff's thinking is maybe we can use these potentials to send signals because they don't interact with shields the same way fields do. That's the fundamental idea. If shields react to E and B, and you send a signal that's mostly A and phi, mm -hmm. maybe it just slips right through. Okay, mine slightly bent. Now, Budoff also talked about zero-point energy, ZPE, and the lamb shift. How do they fit in? Right, ZPE. It's the idea that even a perfect vacuum, supposedly empty space, 
isn't truly empty at the quantum level. It's seething with energy, with fleeting electromagnetic fluctuations, virtual particles popping in and out of existence constantly. So empty space isn't empty, it's buzzing. Pretty much, yeah. And the lamb shift is a key piece of experimental proof. Back in the 40s, physicists found this tiny, unexpected energy difference between two electron levels in a hydrogen atom. Shouldn't have been there, according to the simple theories. And the explanation was? It turned out to be the electron interacting with those virtual photons from the vacuum's zero-point energy. These fleeting fluctuations actually nudge the electron's energy level slightly. Wow. So the vacuum energy is real enough to actually affect atoms. Yes. The lamb shift showed it's not just theoretical math, it has measurable consequences. Now, Ashton Forbes jumps on this. He sort of interprets Puthoff's idea, suggesting maybe you can dip into the ZPE, create little disturbances or ripples in it. Coking a trampoline, maybe? That's his analogy, yeah. He suggests Puthoff might be creating perturbations in the ZPE field that can then be detected somewhere else, maybe without a conventional carrier wave at all. Interesting interpretation. Okay, let's get to the core of Puthoff's patent itself. How does he actually propose sending info using these pure potentials and ditching the problematic fields. The idea is to generate the scalar and vector potentials and then modulate them and code your information onto them. But crucially, you do this while using specially designed antennas that create opposing E and B fields. Opposing fields, so they cancel each other out. That's the goal, yeah. yeah. To arrange things so that in the direction you want to transmit, the electric and magnetic fields largely negate each other, leaving mostly just the potentials carrying the signal. A pure potential signal. Yeah. And since shields react to E and B fields... Which are now mostly canceled. The potential signal might just pass right through the shield. That's the hypothesis. No significant E or B field, nothing for the shield to push back against. Puthoff's analogy was communicating through the ocean to that sub seawater blocks EM, but maybe not this. That would be huge. And he also said this wouldn't interfere with normal radio, right? Yeah, because it's not using the standard electromagnetic spectrum. It'd be like a parallel communication channel invisible to our current receivers, which of course means you need a totally different kind of detector. Right, the detection problem. Yeah. How do you detect something that our usual EM sensors can't see? This is where Putoff says the secret sauce is. Standard antennas rely on E or B fields inducing current. No good here. The solution, according to the patent, involves quantum devices, specifically Josephson junctions. Josephson junctions. Sounds very high tech. What are they? They're pretty amazing, actually. Take two superconducting material materials with zero electrical resistance and separate them with a super thin insulating layer, just a couple of atoms thick sometimes. Okay. In superconductors, electrons pair up. They're called Cooper pairs. And these pairs can actually tunnel straight through that thin insulator, which is impossible, classically. It's pure quantum mechanics. Electrons passing through walls again? Sort of, yeah. And Brian Josephson predicted that if you put a DC voltage across this junction, it generates an AC current oscillating at a very precise frequency, the AC Josephson effect. Okay, interesting. But how does that help detect potentials? Well, the current flowing across that junction is incredibly sensitive to the quantum phase difference between the superconductors on either side. And here's the key part. Electromagnetic potentials, both A and phi, can directly influence this phase difference. Ah, so the junction can feel the potentials even if there are no E or B fields. Exactly. It's sensitive to the underlying potential landscape. Puthoff's patent talks about using the junction to respond specifically to the curl-free part of the vector potential, the A field, in the incoming signal. So the potential wave arrives. It affects the junction's phase. Which changes the current flowing through it, or the voltage across it, in sync with the modulation of the incoming potential wave. I mean, how do you read that change? The junction itself, when operating, emits tiny amounts of electromagnetic radiation, Josephson radiation. So the receiver design involves putting the Josephson junction inside a heavily shielded box. To block out all stray E and B fields? Right. Only the potential wave gets in. That wave perturbs the junction, causing it to emit its characteristic radiation, which is then picked up by a conventional EM detector placed right next to the junction inside the shield. So the junction is like a quantum transducer. It converts the invisible potential wave into a detectable EM signal. That's a great way to put it. A quantum transducer, yeah. Now, Puthoff said they got proof of principle for this way back in the 90s uh. under a classified contract. That's like 
30 years ago. Why aren't we using it? Good question. He explained that while they showed the basics worked, the detector technology, those Josephson junctions, and especially the cryogenic electronics needed to run them super cold, just wasn't mature enough then. Not reliable, not readily available, not ready for prime time, as he put it. So the idea was ahead of the hardware. Pretty much. The project got shelved, but now... Quantum computing has pushed the tech forward. Exactly. All the money and research pouring into quantum computing has led to huge advances in making stable, reliable, superconducting circuits, including Josephson junctions, and the complex cryogenic system is needed to cool them down to near absolute zero. Which is just what put-off's detection method needs. Precisely. He mentioned that this renewed focus on ultra-low temp tech is perfect. He's apparently working now with a lab that builds custom circuits operating around 3.7 Kelvin. That's incredibly cold colder than deep space. So the tech might finally be catching up to the concept. Seems like that's the bet he's making, yeah. That's why he's revisiting it now. Okay, let's circle back to Ashton Forbes and his interpretations. He sees this as more than just communication, doesn't he? Oh yeah, Forbes definitely runs with it. He notes the classified project origin, which fits Prudoff's story, but he interprets the mechanism differently, framing it as manipulating and detecting disturbances in the zero-point energy field itself, using the Josephson junctions as ZPE detectors. And he connects it to scalar waves. What's the link there? Forbes sees a strong connection. The idea of scalar waves often described as being created by canceling out regular EM fields to leave just an oscillation in the potent, like a pressure wave in the vacuum, sounds conceptually very similar to Puthoff's approach of suppressing E and B fields. Though it's fair to say the physics of scalar waves is still debated in mainstream circles. Forbes also mentioned another researcher, Gary Stevenson. Yes, Gary Stevenson. He'd worked with Robert Baker Jr. on high-frequency gravitational waves and independently came up with the idea of using Josephson junctions to detect disturbances in the vacuum or possibly gravity waves. Forbes recounted this story where Stevenson went to Star Cryogenics to build such a detector, and they apparently told him they were already working with Putoff's team on something very similar. Suggests there's some convergence of ideas here among people looking beyond standard EM. Forbes also briefly mentioned Ning Li's work on superconductor gravity effects as being related. Yeah, and Forbes didn't stop there, did he? He went into warp drives and teleportation. Slight chuckle. No, he didn't. He rattled off a whole list. Medical healing, faster than light travel, free energy, teleportation, invisibility, suggesting they might all stem from the same physics involved here. Okay, need to put a flag on that. Those are highly speculative extensions, right? Way beyond the communication patent itself. Absolutely. Crucial distinction. Those are Forbes' far-reaching extrapolations, not what Putoff is claiming for this text, certainly not in the near term. Putoff himself did briefly touch on a possible link to consciousness, though. Oh. Microtubules in brain cells. He did, yeah. He alluded to the penrose hameroff orchor theory. It's this quite controversial but fascinating idea that quantum processes happening inside microtubules, these protein structures within our neurons, might be fundamental to consciousness. The brain as a quantum device, essentially. That's the gist. The theory suggests microtubules could act as biological quantum information processors or detectors. Is there any evidence for quantum stuff happening in warm, wet brain cells? Well, there is some recent experimental work showing quantum vibrations persisting in microtubules at body temperature, and other studies suggesting anesthetics might work by dampening these vibrations. It's still very early days and highly debated, but... But Putoff's point was, Maybe nature already figured out quantum detection. Yeah, his thinking seemed to be. If we're now engineering artificial quantum detectors like Josephson junctions, maybe biology evolved its own versions millions of years ago. It's a provocative thought. And Forbes' is more out-there ideas kind of build on that. If we can tap into this fundamental quantum potential level, maybe the sky's the limit. That seems to be the reasoning. If you can fundamentally engineer reality at the quantum potential or ZPE level, then maybe all these other things become theoretically possible, however far off. But again, huge grain of salt needed for those extrapolations. Okay, let's try and wrap this up. What's the core takeaway on Puthoff's quantum communication idea? The absolute core is transmit information by modulating electromagnetic potentials, A and phi, while simultaneously canceling out the usual electric and magnetic fields, E and B. Creating a signal that bypasses conventional shields. Potentially, yes. And detecting this pure potential signal requires sensitive quantum devices like 
Joseph's injunctions, acting as transducers. And scientifically, this isn't pulled out of thin air. No, it leans on established quantum phenomena. The heronov bohm effect showing potentials are real, the Josephson effect providing a detection mechanism, and the concept of zero-point energy being physically significant. But the engineering is clearly a massive challenge. Oh, undoubtedly. Building transmitters that perfectly cancel fields, making receivers sensitive enough dealing with cryogenics? Huge technical hurdles remain. Still, the payoff could be immense, couldn't it? Communication through anything, no interference, inherent security maybe. Exactly. Those potential benefits are why people are pursuing these seemingly exotic ideas. It's genuinely game-changing if it can be made practical. So, maybe final thought to leave our listeners with. If potentials and the quantum vacuum are more active, more real than we used to think, mm. what else might be hidden there? What other technologies could emerge if we learn to look beyond just E and B fields? And maybe even, has nature already beaten us to it? Could there be forms of biological quantum sensing or communication we haven't even recognized yet? Lots to think about.